1993, Little Eddie P turns 11. Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe, Wizard number 23, July 1993. My name is Jim Rugg. My name is Ed Piscor. The culmination of my comics reading experience up to this point, Image and Valiant meet. <laughs> and Wizard knows it with their double gate fold. Yeah, geez, I'd like to see the original for this baby, man. Just looking at the top masthead and the contents within this magazine, it really, it almost triggered me. Jim, because uh, what we are going to see in this magazine, um, there was a period of time, like in those 90s, when all of us kids were getting into the game, and there really were these dividing lines of like our comics and like their comics. And it is all throughout this thing, and we'll get into that deeper in this episode. Yeah, good point, Ed. It, it, it is interesting. This is part of the comics in the 90s that I enjoy, and that's whenever things are just going like. Expand, expand, expand. I mean, this is four pages of advertising that Malibu is buying. <laughs> yeah, we can't even show it all on one screen. Not that you're missing much, but it's culminating in Ultraverse advertising. You'd think they'd do better with four pages and it's just boring type, but I guess that's pretty apt for the comics they're going to put out. That's, that's the other thing that I made note of is that uh, Wizard could not make the page count high enough to sell off their ads, I would bet you that they may have even have done an auction for ad placement because Life Out buys so many pages, Malibu buys so many pages. Like, it's primo real estate. These guys all know it, and they Wizard had to have been getting top dollar for these ads. No doubt about it. Uh, we've talked a lot about how well Wizard was selling at this point. You know, they're outselling almost every comic book, and that ad revenue is <laughs> is going to soar with those kind of numbers. Avengers Assemble. I wanted to call attention to Avengers are at a pretty low point in their history here. That's you can see sure. that team's not too good. There's been articles in recent issues about poor sales for the Avengers. We don't see them anywhere in the top sales lists as we go through these, pretty much since we've been reading Wizard. Um, Bob Harris is the writer of Avengers at this point. Chris Claremont has been critical of Bob Harris. Bob Harris is the ex-editor at this time too and would go on to become the Marvel editor-in-chief when Marvel goes bankrupt. It feels like one more knock against Bob Harris here is his writing Avengers at possibly Avengers' lowest point in their history. Avengers was so whack when we were growing up, and X-Men was so cool, and the inverse has happened in later days, which is why I had to make my X-Men comic, dude. It's like, I have to, I cannot live in a world where the Avengers are cooler than the X-Men, and it's because of, you know, this mullet-headed um, Hercules and this Black Knight who's wearing a damn leather jacket you know what i'm saying i can't name most of these characters black widow and black knight are the only ones i didn't know that was hercules i don't know who these two are is that scarlet witch maybe i i'm guessing yes and and that's uh that's crystal from the inhumans yeah so this is one of those where like i'm not sure if bob harris is to blame for this but he's got a couple of knocks on him from from wizard coverage that's true i'm not gonna hold this one against him too much because the avengers was pretty whack for as long as i've been around I got nothing out of the letter from the publisher. It's Wizard continues to soar. My outstanding note from this opening is the magic words letter from Eric Larson. Spicy. Eviscerating David Michelini's claim as being the creator of Venom. In my uh, in my like kind of co comics career and like meeting and, and getting to know people, um, anybody in comics is not like my real friends who will um, who are my soldiers and who will defend me fucking and take a bullet for me. Like, uh, Larson here, he's taking a bullet for his man, Todd McFarlane, and I give him mad props because almost everybody I meet is very careerist and they're just climbers and shit, but the people who aren't are the people at the tippity top of the game, man. They're the, they are the most uh, magnanimous and helpful people in comics, and these guys are at the height of their game, man, and they have nothing to prove to anybody, and they made themselves so they can, they can cut some promos, man. Well, I was going to say, besides McFarlane... Eric Larson worked with Michelini on Amazing Spider-Man for years, so this may be more about Michelini than it is loyalty to McFarlane. I don't know that to be true, but it is a scathing letter. Larson is hardcore at this time, man. He he 
you know, recently is outed as name withheld, the guy who's saying that like artists drive these books and, and yada yada, and these guys are all Jack Kirby proponents and shit. So when he sees Michelini in the last issue of Wizard, or maybe the one before, talking about how he's the sole creator of Venom, man, Larson wasn't sitting still for that shit. Right here, it's all lip service because there was no film or anything like that. But these distinctions matter so much more nowadays where it's like there are equity rights or uh, incentives for people who created the characters, blah, blah, blah. They make a note. They gave Michelini a chance to respond to the letter, and, uh, and he does not. He declined. And then they go through kind of the history of Venom of what we know from comic book appearances. Spicy. Yeah, I'll say. It's a little bit of like Blood and Guts comics comics journal style letter column to open it up. It's it's what happens when millions of dollars are at play and shit. You know what I'm saying? Like Wizard News. Toy Biz makes marvelous deal. This is a fascinating article given the history of comics, what we know since since nineteen ninety three. We're like Uwatu the Watcher, man. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it like, feels like, like, it. like we know what's happening. We know what's what's down the pike for these bastards right here. This is the first uh, mention that I have seen of Avi Arid. Goes on to be a big, big shot at Marvel. And one of the things where he first establishes himself, he's coming from Toy Biz at this point. After Marvel declares bankruptcy, Arid and his partner kind of go against uh, Terry Stewart and his partner for control of Marvel as they come out of bankruptcy. And, and Arid and his partner from Toy Biz take control at that point. Yeah, he, that... of course, goes on to be the founder and CEO of, of you know, Marvel Studios, the, the big movement of the Marvel Universe, the film universe. He goes from toy designer to kind of like head of building this $4 billion company. And this is really the beginning of that. He was a giant fan of Liefeld Lee and all of those guys, man. And 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 he he saw the the waning, like he saw that Marvel was in a little bit of trouble. So they they made those strikes, man. And you will see like lots of interviews with uh, Rob Liefeld, Jim Lee, um, talking about how they had all these you know cable toy biz action figures put together and it was uh pearl muter and, and avi arad who were like we love cable he's a mixture of x-men and gi joe and and there were like seven or eight fucking cable toys that that were made man he, he seems like an impressive guy you know um wounded in the in israel doing his mandatory service there child of holocaust survivors from poland you know comes to america goes to school for like industrial design and it's a remarkable career he's had, and I think it's testament to, uh, man, what must be an astonishing work ethic and vision. All Red's Madman number one sells out. 40,000 copies of that baby sold out, man. Good good for him, man. Real strong for an indie book. There's going to be more video game coverage uh, in this Wizard Newsman, but the one that I wanted to point some attention to is the Sam and Max game, because that's uh, Steve Purcell. He did uh, a lot of, uh, like... Epic comics, Kamiko comics with the Sam and Max characters. Really, really awesome cartoonist. But then he also did do a lot of like cover art and shit for, for Lucas Arts, man. So he owned the copyrights, you know, Sam and Max. It was an epic comic. He owned it and they developed it into video games here um, and continuing throughout the years, man. So just wanted to call attention to that because his comics, they're a very rare morsel, but man, are they beautiful to look at. That's good. Another rare morsel is Peter Chung, Aeon Flux creator. I don't see enough of his art in my life. Yes. So this caught my eye. It's a role-playing game called Underground, and it has art from Jeff Darrow, Brian Bullen, and Peter Chung, amongst others. So that kind of stood out. It made me curious to flip through that book if I ever come across it. They dropped a couple dollars on that. And I do want to point out to this here, man. This is a Jeff Matsuda piece, this cover for Brigade Number no. 0. And it was just an issue or two ago that Jeff Matsuda had letter art in Wizard Magazine when there was an interview with Rob Liefeld. So it's almost like Liefeld was using Wizards like a trade mag for like promising new talent, man. And and this material right here is such a higher level than than the uh, letter yeah, art from the earlier issue. Comment on that. I like Masudo, all right. He was one of those extreme artists that had a little bit of a distinct flavor to his style. I'd probably put him maybe third after uh, Fraga in my in my pantheon of these, well, maybe fourth, Chap Chappie eight, maybe ahead of him. <laughs> I'd be uh, comfortable with that man. And this piece is uh, colored by T Kiko Tagadashi, who's who's like the premier uh, extreme colorist. Like each studio had their guy. Kiko was the guy for um, extreme. A couple fun things in uh, in Marvel. Um, they're talking about 
changes are going to be made to Daredevil. So Batman got his back broke, Superman got his ass killed, and Daredevil is going to get a really ugly costume. <laughs> also, very first mention of the Marvel's miniseries is in here, and Alex Ross's name is not mentioned whatsoever. I do like seeing those kinds of things, because that goes on to be a huge kind of 90s defining book in a lot of ways, especially for Marvel. You know, it, it influenced so much stuff going forward, you know, going on to Kingdom Come and, and establishing Alex Ross as a superstar in comics. And it's like, rarely are the things that turn out to be momentous recognized ahead of time there in was, these pages. There, yeah, there was nothing like it. Um, you know, his, he had no name equity. He would, At this time, he did a couple of Terminator comics. He did a couple uh, Clive Barker things. And they just looked as good as, as any uh, you know, Dan Brereton or, or, or any, any of those things, man. So he will become the fucking darling of Wizard in about a dozen issues or more. Um, but this was the first mention of that series. Probably one of Marvel's only kind of perennials because they just don't, that's not their business, the business that they're in. And Marvel seems to have been a regular seller since, since the date of its inception. Pat O'Neill kind of looking at this loaded summer 93 and, and dispensing advice. You know, we, we see that kind of throughout this issue and, and maybe a little bit in the last issue too is there's just so many new comics coming onto the market, it's very hard to figure out what to do. I was pretty uh, pretty hard on Pat O'Neill last issue. Stung. <laughs> I'm swinging back around this issue, because I realize he talks about Fantastic Four number one in the summer of 93. And I thought he would have been about 10 whenever that book came out. Yeah, 1961. Six, six, yeah, yeah. It's, it's such a different uh, perspective to me to think like, you know, if that's what you grew up with, like imagine, you know, last issue, he says 10 is like the, the golden age for sci-fi and for superheroes. Imagine finding Fantastic Four when you're eight or 10 years old and then, you know, being a lifetime comic book fan, that would be magic. So I give him a little bit, I cut him a little bit of slack because I can imagine uh, it'd be tough to stomach the summer of 93 if you were in like prime time whenever the Jack Kirby Stanley Fantastic Four run happened. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I'm still not going to let him off the hook with a lot of stuff, but I, I get what you're saying. Other note here is uh, strategies of what to do to try to navigate this summer of so many comics and stores being overwhelmed and maybe not ordering right. And one of the big pieces of advice is pre-order. And I think like, what an indictment of the comics industry that here we are 26 years later, and that's still our advice. How I, have we not evolved? How are we still stuck in 1993 mode as an industry? Shame on all of us. It's it's um there needs to be somebody with the the charisma to just kind of like make make this shit work, you know what I'm saying? And it has to be adopted by all of us. So like every time we do a kayfabe weekly shoot or something, you're never going to hear me say um uh uh final order cutoff date blah blah blah. Here's the code. Fuck that. Go to your store. Just let them know that you could get it. That's right now that's the best you could do. We're doomed if we don't come up with a better thing. Look at any businesses that haven't haven't changed in 26 years and tell me how they're doing. No doubt, man. And, and what, what is coming from this is the fact that uh, self-publishing is becoming a real thing. So we have our cha our channel here and we're building a brand and we're going to be able to, uh, to cater to our own audiences, man. We're going to have to do more work on the front end. But listen, it worked out for Eastman and Laird. That's what we've seen happen is alternative distribution models, yeah. whether it's bookstores, libraries, Kickstarters, whatever. Like this is where people seem to be thriving in this industry. And we just got to find ways to, to make it easier to get comics. Deathmate comes alive. Exhibit A of our, my comics and their comics, because <laughs> I was full on for this, man. And I think we made mention last episode about what was up with Shaft's ponytail. It was never in canon of the normal <laughs> Youngblood series, but we discovered that a part of the creative uh, solution of marrying the Valiant and Image universe is that uh, it's alternate universe. A universe where Shaft has a ponytail. <laughs> That's the big change. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a... Uh, Look at that. This is such a perfect crossover, no-brainer. I, there, there, You could not have come up with a car crossover I'd be more excited about in 1993 than this one. Definitely, as you say, Ed, this is, these are your companies. These are your comics. They create... The parameters are perfect, you know, because there's basically total creative freedom. It's a what-if story. And by the way, when I say my comics and their comics, I was on board for Deathmate Red and Black, 
your daddy could go read fucking <laughs> Silver and Blue because I ain't fucking with that. That shit looks so boring compared to this. This is the coolest blood bloodshot ever looked, man. I have to flip through this now and see. Like, there is zero. <laughs> Go back real this, quick. This is the only piece of, uh, th- this is, I guess, Barry Windsor Smith. The only pieces of Valiant art in this piece. It's almost all image creators. Burn this into your mind, K. Fabers, man, because there was a young Eddie P. at this time who was eating all this shit up, man. And I just graduated from drawing Wiley Coyotes and shit like that. A little hot on the cam, but look at that shaft right there with them super <laughs> tiny legs. You needed a Danny Mickey to ink that thing, you know, make it pop. <laughs> hey, I noticed Bloodshot's not on your drawing. Yeah, I was like, who is that? <laughs> <laughs> so I think they, they're pretty smart with what they're putting together. They have color books, as you say, blue and yellow and red and black instead of numbers. And they, they acknowledge, you know, the elephant in the room is all of image books are late. So we're going to circumvent the numbering system in case there are shipping problems. It's not going to affect your ability to read these books. They're more or less standalone besides the prologue and epilogue. And pretty smart, you know, and, and really using what these companies have. It's image showing off their art, as we're talking about. You know, the, these aren't bound by any continuity. Draw cool looking stuff. You know how to sell books, obviously. Do your thing. I had them. I love them. I tried to read them. I got so bored with that part of the job. Can I call uh, Rob Liefeld a bastard, though, when it came to <laughs> Deathmate Red? And I like, I don't know if you pulled uh, Deathmate Red or anything, but. Uh, when I you, pull it in eight months when it comes out. <laughs> when yeah, <laughs> when when you take a look through that issue, I mentioned Kiko Taganashi earlier, and he hoarded Kiko for himself. So all the pages that Rob Liefeld drew has the beautiful Kiko fucking coloring, <laughs> and everybody else gets such shit coloring in that book. Man. Can you argue? <laughs> They mentioned the Deathmate tours. So the image guys have had really good success touring. <laughs> wow, wow, does this not show up? Oh, I yeah, found this uh, I found this in like a quarter box, and it's it's the Deathmate tour book. So they're sending uh, their, their teams out to hit comic stores and conventions and stuff. This becomes a staple in image, I think, going back to their announcement of forming the company at Chicago and having, you know, 10,000 fans. Got to pound that pavement, man. Four bucks for this thing. Doesn't even show up on camera. But it's just a tour book, and it's like profiles of uh, of the different creators who are involved. And so they would, I guess, have these at the tour stops. You could buy them and get the creators to sign them. But it's it's fluff pieces. It's a lot like the Image Plus, you know, that we looked at last issue. Uh, I don't know, man. For, you know, this is the cost of two two comics at the time. Pretty weird, though. It's only worth about a quarter now. So you're saying you paid uh, 25 cents too much? <laughs> yeah, I, got, I, I was overcharged. <laughs> Disappointed when I got home and read that. Jim Lee talks about inking Barry Windsor Smith, I think in the prologue issue, and talks about like the, the hard psychological stress of uh, finishing art and, and kind of gives inkers some props in that note. They open the article with the word fun, all in uh, red letters and, and bigger font size. That comes up a couple times this issue. I actually, in my notes nicknamed this issue the fun issue i think that's the right approach to this i also may note that you know there are two small companies that use that smallness to their advantage and that they can put together this crossover in a way that dc and marvel just seem unable to do company crossovers at this point and being a small company two small companies they're able to take advantage of that and sort of put this together quickly and make it happen yeah, yeah. These these properties are newly established. They're they're all basically barely a year old. So it's not like when you have Superman and Sp- Spider Man meet up and you have two giant corporations like behind both with vested interests to make sure that their property doesn't look stupid. Uh, they don't just didn't have these concerns right here, man. The whole the whole enterprise came to fruition from a dinner at some comic convention that Jim Lee had with some of those schmucks over there at Valiant. Yeah, they don't have toys yet that you have to match. They're not working off model sheets. <laughs> Another new universe of superheroes, bucking the superhero odds. Uh, that's in reference to there being a hundred new superhero universes at this point. Why does this one stand out? Dark Horse has been around since 86. We've looked at profiles of them in Wizard Magazine. This is their effort to create and own their own characters. Usually they do licensed properties or creator owned characters. This time it's going to be a company owned universe of superheroes. 16 issues. They're going to release these issues weekly over the course of four months. I recently found all of these for 50 cents. So their gimmick were $1 issues, easy to try it out. Hopefully 
people would be willing to part with a dollar at the new comics Wednesdays. Here's the big innovation that they that they uh, used to create these comics. They created the rules of the universe first, and then they fit the characters into it. So they create fictional cities that then can be destroyed. Blah 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 blah. A lot of hokum. Hmm. A lot of hokum. If you read, uh, if you read Marvel comics from the earliest days, man, it just builds so naturally. No m motivation of like interconnecting all these things. It just kind of worked out that way so naturally. You cannot force these things. Paul Galassi drawing barbed wire. I guess their biggest hit, right? I mean, it's it led to a movie. Pam, Pam Anderson showed her boobies in it. <laughs> Is that true? I never saw it. I was kind of underwhelmed. I like Paul Galassi, and I, I found this to be not his most inspired work. No, his Dark Horse work isn't what you're looking at when you want Paul Galassi stuff. I was surprised revisiting these at just how kind of uninspired and generic they feel. You know, Machine, there's a character named Monster. It's it's not... Uh, yeah, it's all nonsense. Like Not very exciting. The, that, mean, that's about as generic as you get. Look at that hair. If if you need more generic mecha titan like these these aren't there's no nothing reason, too exciting here there's no reason to do your a game hero zero for guys that you you know you don't get to own these things fuck that like why am I gonna like design anything cool for you all of these people are just taking money they're they're all just taking Mike Richardson's money man yeah they they have a couple Frank Miller does a couple of covers. A few notable creators, we mentioned Paul Galassi, this is Paul Chadwick, does the interiors of King Tiger. Man, there aren't, there aren't too many things to call out. You know, Chris Warner works on X, uh, he was the guy that drew the first Predator comic. Yeah, and he's like the art director or something. He's got, he's got a more uh, privileged position over there at the DH, man, than uh, your, your regular job. Or, but that's what this is. It's everybody in pro wrestling parlance, everybody's laying down. Adam Hughes draws the uh, Ghost special. Probably a high point there is eventually a, a crossover with Hellboy a few years later. A few of these characters would spin off into monthly titles um, after this first 16-issue run, um, but I don't think any of those left much of a mark. No. The power of images is too strong, you know, and, and the fact that you could make something and prosper yourself. The spin on Vertigo... DC's new imprint is designed to attract an adult audience and expand the horizons of the medium. I don't know in a million years if this is the universe or imprint that you would bet on in 1990, from this issue. In 1993, when this comes out, it's incredible to me to think that Vertigo is still around. In a time when image, as you say, is sort of, it's hard to step to them, Vertigo goes the other way, focuses on writers, and they're still around. This is, this is exactly what I'm talking about, of like... When I was picking up my deathmates and stuff, and I would see these very like these painterly covers and these kind of like this goth imagery, I always just associated that with like teenagers. Or so you know, like th this is like these are for adults. These are the big people's comics. Yeah, and that's written about right in, right off the get go. Karen Berger is the editor behind this group of titles always was a great ambassador for comics, I think. And, and you can see it here, you know, like we get to see all of these profile puff pieces on all these different companies. To me, this one comes off with the clearest vision of, of what they are doing, who their audience is. She talks about trying to get a different audience. And DC puts some money behind that. There's some advertising programs that they talk about for non-traditional advertising outlets. So this would be things like alt-weekly papers, you know, that are maybe in a school market. Uh, you know, like a university market or somewhere, somewhere where you can reach some people that aren't typically your Wednesday warrior type shoppers. I mean, down to the New York Times, you know, New York Times, Village Voice. Exactly. All of that stuff. It, 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 basically addressing a lot of stuff that Patrick Daniel O'Neill mentioned in an editorial in like issue two or three of Wizard Magazine. Like, why are they not peddling these books to uh, those kind of venues? And DC listened and put some money in the coffers for promotion of Vertigo. I did not realize Vertigo wasn't around before this either because a lot of their titles, things like Doom Patrol, you know, I think of Grant Morrison, Doom Patrol yeah. as Vertigo. It had published a long time before Vertigo was an imprint. Yeah, um, they, they fooled in here. That's what mm -hmm. I like about this article. It's like the Karen Berger uh, origin story and, and Vertigo, you know? So it talks about how, like, she was just an assistant editor on the mystery horror books, then, like, graduated. Imagine this graduation. Like, then she gets to edit... Swamp Thing by Alan Moore. 
You know what I'm saying? And then that thing goes gangbusters. And then uh, she becomes the figurehead for what what they called in-house the Burger Books, which will then become known as the Vertigo imprint. And now she has Burger Books right now, like the imprint with Dark Horse in, in 2019. Yeah, it's it's a pretty impressive article. Again, compared to some of the other publisher puff pieces, this one feels very focused. There's a huge slate of books that they're preparing. I brought a couple to kind of talk about. One note is a lot of 80s artists, uh, black and white artists, are being represented here. Michael Zuli from Puma Blues, Ted McKeever, who we've spotlighted in a previous Palmer's Picks. And in fact, his title, I'll, I'll show off a couple issues while we talk here, The Extremist. Uh, written by Peter Milligan, drawn by Ted McKeever. Pretty different art style and everything, you know? I mean, I think it's clear if you flip through these Vertigo books, they do look very different. Yeah. And a lot more interesting looking than Comics Greatest World that we just flipped through. Maybe even scary to an 11-year-old. I'm trying to put my mind in, into, into you know, where my headspace was back then, and I think that this would look, like, odd to me, man. Yeah, this is not what we were seeing in image books at the time. Another guy they mentioned is, is uh, you know, would fitting in your thing would be uh, Guy Davis. Yes, who Sandman would, Mystery Theater. Yep, uh, written, written by Matt Wagner. Yes. Was also another black and white guy from that period. Um, Mike Allred is, is being listed here in some books that he's going to be doing some artwork on. So he's starting to, you know, these editors are finding talent from across the spectrum of comics. It's not just superhero stuff. And it always saves the day. If you, if you, um, you could map it every, say, five years, because the next, the next batch of the indie people that get kind of, like, pillaged would be, like, the David Mack, the Brian Michael Bendis guys, you know? So, like, every five years or maybe ten years, they'll get the best of the indies to do, like, the best, you know, at Brubaker. Like I said, I was surprised to see Vertigo in here. I thought it had been around for a while, so it's it's pretty interesting to see. In a way, they, they tested and worked out a lot of their kinks before they put the Vertigo imprint on paper, in promos, and, and really got behind it. And they're ready to go, you know, like they have a full stock. Uh, another book that they mentioned, Jonah Hex. Uh, I was a Tim Truman mark at the time, so I picked this up whenever it came out. Uh, Joe R. Lansdell, the writer, is a, is a novelist traditionally. So, you know, they're looking outside of comics to find to find talent. Uh, not just alternative comics, but, you know, novelists, writers, uh, screenwriters. A little bit broader survey than, than you would typically find. This was an era, too, where there were... Um, you could count the number of uh, women working in comics, like in the creative space, uh, probably on two hands, with fingers left over. And maybe 50% of them are working for Vertigo at this point, too, man. We're talking Jill Thompson. We're talking Anne Nocenti. She, she um, you know, left Daredevil and doing editorial stuff over at Marvel to write, I think it was Kid Eternity with uh, Sean Phillips drawing. Yeah, another name who, you know, still around comics and, and very successful artist all this time later. So a good eye for talent, no doubt. I want to call attention to this Westfield Comics ad. We have looked at this ad for, I don't know, maybe all two years of Wizards history. <laughs> it's lousy, right? I or maybe agree. it's good because no other ad looks like this. Most of them feature some poorly drawn character or something. I don't know if I like it or hate it, but I feel like it has to be mentioned. <laughs> Sooner or later, it's going to go away, I think. And it's absurd. Every issue, this appears. Yeah, and, and you know, it's a comic book distributor, so what sells comics better? An empty road. Yeah. Something metaphorical there. <laughs> Very odd. Should note, Sandman's at issue 50 at the time of this article, right around issue 50. That's pretty far in its run. That's another one that surprised me. I think of Sandman as, as sort of running all through the 90s, but if it's at issue 50 and 93, like that's only a couple years to go. One other thing worth noting uh, in the Vertigo article is the fact that they are dabbling in creator-owned properties. And there were a lot of like missteps earlier in the 80s. Like Karen had to weather some storms, and one of the major storms was... Alan Moore, <laughs> and the fact that that he um, had a lot of grievances, mm -hmm. man. He a lot of uh, a lot of confusion in their earlier enterprise, in their earlier dealings with one another. So she's trying to not make good, but she they have to compete. Image exists, and image is selling like crazy. And why would people do so much work for hire if if they didn't have to? So she's bringing in these independent talents. And you could just bet 
that she was probably peppering some stuff in there like well you know we have a creator owned uh position in our in our uh imprint as well and furthermore she's publicizing some of the books in here which is never done at vertigo really i, I mean excuse me at uh, epic comics like marvel would never take that much time to promote um you know the rick veach epic comics in comics journal or something like that they talk about that contract in here she even uses the word negotiable so like you know come talk to me if you if you've got something you think would fit here and and we'll you know we can massage the contract a little bit to to suit your purposes so it is interesting it, it like you say ed we we've, we've seen companies make weird references to who owns what yeah uh, you know, creator driven, I think is a, is a phrase we've seen. In, yeah. Uh, cre creator controlled. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, so, Orwellian uh, double speak. It, it's, I, I made a note of that too. It's pretty unusual to see somebody reference, reference their contracts in this way. There's, there's something uncanny Valley about this mm -hmm. looks kind of real, but definitely not. What do you think that's drawn with? Do you think that's pastels or I, something? That's the first thing that came to my mind. <laughs> That's pretty unusual. <laughs> it's a big neck, man. Once again, man, go to Greg Coppola's Instagram and watch him put this like giant neck uh, weight around his head <laughs> and build up those friggin' uh, jugular veins. I kind of do have something to say about the my kind of hero thing, though. Okay. Give these guys money to make these comics. I would I would definitely read these two books. I might read Grunge. I'd give it a flip through. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I would like to see more Edge. And Northern Command looks professional. This feels like the audition to join Extreme Studios. I don't think the guy does, man. But uh, I like all three of these, man. I'm on board for them all. Quesada original art ad. Pretty nice one, too. Like, we just pointed out a bad ad. We pointed out bad ads in the past. Big full color ad in Wizard for Quesada original art. Guy has a kind of a. This is another example of vision. I don't see any other artist doing this. I don't know if he parlayed his feature last issue into some advertising space or how he comes about a full page full color ad, but nobody else is doing it yet. And we know original art has become, you know, a pretty big chunk of comics revenue. So ahead of the game. Like Jay Z, man. He's a hustler. He just so happens to draw comics. Brutes and Babes, Silhouettes and Breaking Panels. Uh, recently, we did a show and tell on a silhouette zine that I made. We'll have a link below this video where you can see more on that. But this was a big thing for me, silhouettes. You know, it left a, left a mark, I suppose. Could be a controversial uh, topic when uh, discussing it because the uninitiated would think that they're just not getting their money's worth as readers, that you're uh, taking shortcuts. But it's a very viable and striking uh, storytelling mechanism. This one always stood out to me, this column, because it was probably relatively new to me, but also his silhouettes are super complex. And it's almost a magic trick where it's like, man, he's not drawing anything except like, you can see he's pulling an arrow out. You can see the, the hair, the feather, you know, like all this information is there, even though... It kind of looks like nothing is there, as you say, possibly a shortcut or what may be viewed as a shortcut. Yeah, um, I'm not saying that Bart Sears used it to great thematic effect or whatever. He might have been uh, cut in a couple corners, but you can use silhouettes. Uh, I think they're great, great illustrations. I absolutely love like that composition. I think it's beautiful. I think that composition is really strong. So this one left a mark. You know, I, I remembered it years later whenever I was commissioned to do a zine. Uh, that's you know, what led me back to looking at Wizards again. So it was something I remembered, you know, 20 years later. And he's going all out. His column is so inconsistent. I think uh, last issue or the one before, we're looking at like cylinders and, and uh, scale for drawing human figures. Now we're doing silhouettes and breaking panel borders and when to use that in a comic uh, for dramatic effect and for storytelling purposes. And Kay Favors, I'm going to tell you something right now that maybe a lot of other cartoonists d don't don't want the secret to get out, but we really don't know shit. And he's talking about uh, different examples of like what not to do. And almost none of these I would have a problem with in a way, especially this one, like breaking the bottom and top. Why the fuck not? I could see not doing it at the corner just because that's an ugly kind of composition. But once again, that's that's my taste. Maybe it could work. Yeah, I'd sign off on all three of these. Yeah. You're right. This is the one that, that I'm not as sure about, but... This is this is brutes and babes. You know what I mean? Like it's <laughs> it's a it's a weird column. It's fun to uh, fun to look through though, and, and and especially to remember me as a youngster trying to like 
figure out what this all means. And there are some good rules about where to break stuff. Uh, often you'll see people break hands or something at the border. Maybe not breaking the border, but actually just chopping off a composition there. That's one that's a no-no that I probably picked up somewhere in this kind of writing. And some of it does make sense. Yeah, sure. But I just want the cave verbers to know that a lot of this stuff is uh, subjective. So um, consider consider your sources when you're making your comics. And, d and don't feel too overwhelmed by getting too many rules uh, th thrown down your throat. Because that's the thing that these brutes and babes would do to me. It would it would uh, sort of scare me a little bit. It would sometimes complicate things and send my mind to a bunch of places where the real focus should be when you're starting out, just make some fucking comics. Just do it. Yeah. And by the way, when I was starting out making comics, I don't know if I ever did silhouettes. It was a long way in before I started thinking about a silhouette and actually drawing a page of comics. Tribe number five. Yeah. Tribe went through multiple publishers, it lasted several years to get those issues out, and I think three were to in total printed. I was going to say, man, like they definitely uh, bought some ad space well in advance, because I don't even remember there being a second image issue. No, there wasn't. Although it was listed last issue as being uh, <laughs> available on sale. I do like this ad, though. I love the purple and yellow composition. I don't know what Crush Velvet is, but I, I wish uh, I wish Tribe 5 had come out. And I'm going to say, to me, it's a dumb ad because I love Larry Stroman's art. And if you're going to sell a comic, let's see a fucking drawing. That's fair. Savage Dragon versus Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Savage Dragon number two. Eric Larson buying a couple ad pages, man. We could just call these names off, man. And you, we're going to see who's got the who's got the pockets, man, to invest in promoting their comics. I'm ready for Eric Larson to dash off a mean letter for not getting more coverage in here. Like, come on already. Toying around. Hot toys for hot summer movies. Not too much in the body of the article, but it's the first uh, action figure price guide. Anything stand out in there? Nothing too much, man. I was taking a look to see what my black costume Spider-Man was worth. <laughs> Not too much right here yet. Last Action Hero was such a colossal failure, and that action figure photo might sum it all up perfectly. <laughs> Not a very exciting figure. Again, doing the image test at this time period, not a very exciting action figure. Well said. I, th I think Avi Arad would not approve of that figure. <laughs> not the best comics ad. When I w first read this, I thought it was the hunt for Magneto's son. I, you know what? I did too. <laughs> you, you blow my you blow my <laughs> you blow my mind because I was thinking that the whole time. Actually, I thought this art was pretty impressive. From a production standpoint, there's some hours logged on draw on painting this thing. Is that Tex? No, I guess probably not. Bob Larkin. Mm. Hey, good for him. I think I looked Bob Larkin up and for a minute thought it was Bob Camp and realized that's a different different dudes. But it's still like a lot of a lot of work on that page. Nemesis. Man, this issue's all about the ads. Do you know who this ad is for? Uh, I don't. Well, like, well. I would have to say probably Harvey, right? Harvey like, Comics. Yeah, yeah, this would have been the death throes of Harvey Comics, Richie Rich, Little Dot, all of those books. This is what it looked like in the end. And and, and here's why I know. Only because I recently watched an earlier uh, Wizard episode, and we pull out an issue of uh, Ultraman. I would not have guessed. It that blows my mind. I mean, I look at some, Casper the Friendly Ghost, yeah. you know, like Harvey's this kid's publisher for, for decades, for a long time. They published Richie Rich, and at the time, there were like 20 Richie Rich oh, yeah. monthly books in the late 70s, early 80s. That was the, the most popular comic book on the racks, and and this is how they, this is basically their demise here. That Sequest fucking uh, license, man, that was the death of them, dude. The thing I always liked uh, about the brazenness of old Harvey comics is they're the only publisher, page one, ads. <laughs> <laughs> Everything in the kitchen sink too. Once again, man, the Tundra books, adult comics to me. Well, like like when I was a kid, you know. That's that's why I don't have any. Like because it was like I was going for Brigade, you know. And I, I saw those comics, just like yeah, that, that looks like it's for big people. That and also because Brigade was selling four hundred thousand copies, and Madman, their top seller, was selling forty thousand. <laughs> so right. a little bit harder to come by. So this article, this is a preview of Tundra titles that are planned for summer of '93. It's written by Tom Palmer Jr. For a minute, I thought this was the Palmer's Picks column, so yeah. good to see Tom Palmer out again. 
he had written a Tundra profile, I don't know, a year ago, maybe in Wizard. He's their indie uh, go-to person. This is a, a fascinating article. And as they were going to press, Kitchen Sing buys Tundra. So most of the article is written without that knowledge. And then this little sidebar explains that that happened. Yeah, it's it's interesting placement for that piece because uh, you still have two or three pages to read and you're getting this little sidebar to tell you that everything you just read is meaningless. In a lot of ways. This is this goes back to, you know, magazine publishing, print publishing. Like, you can't just stop the uh, the train in the middle of the tracks. This is fascinating to me, though, because looking back, I didn't... Things exist in different orders. You mentioned not buying Tundra at the time. You're buying Brigade. I was, too. And I would come back to some of these titles. Eddie Campbell doing Graffiti Kitchen, From Hell, Madman, Understanding Comics. All these things existed sort of after I moved on from Image and I start looking elsewhere. Yeah. But they were happening at the same time. So when we started this, everybody's trashing 90s comics, right? Image sucks and, and this and that. Tundra was also happening. You know, like, like there were books of merit. Dave McKean is publishing Cages at this time through Tundra. You know, a lot of char- a lot of creators that would go on to great respect and a lot of books that we would continue to see in print and celebrate it and read after the fact is happening concurrently with Image. That blew my mind reading this issue. You know, another thing that uh, sort of blew my mind with this piece, because we made a discovery in some old ads in earlier episodes that Understanding Comics was to be a Tundra book. And we were probably not, like, we were just having that thought exercise, like, what would have happened if they would have been able to come out, like, for Tundra? But in this article, you also discover that they were gearing up for a collection of the fucking Crow trade paperback that they were going to put out on the heels of the movie that was going to be released, which is delayed a little bit because of the unfortunate demise of, of Brandon Lee and, and, and all of that drama. But they had two tentpole books like in the works that they were not able to directly prosper from. It's unreal. And, you know, I, I made a list of the creators that are just listed with books that are coming out summer of 93 here. And let me run through this list. Scott McCloud, Eddie Campbell... Alan Moore, Mike Allred, Jim Woodring, Rick Veach, James O'Barr, Dave McKean, Charles Burns. This is a murderer's row. This is like the 1920s Yankees batting lineup of of interesting, noteworthy, successful cartoonists that were coming out of Tundra. So for all the, the, the laughing stock that Tundra is considered in a lot of ways, when you dig into the truth here... It's really impressive what their slate was. Like, they just missed it by, you know, how short of the finish line was it? When did they sell out to Kitchen Sink that this would have gone on to become known as, like, some important publisher if they had just made it to the end of the summer instead of folding in the beginning? I'm uh, doing these shows. I'm connecting dots, right? And I had no knowledge that this is, like, what went down. I knew there was an association between Eastman and and Kitchen, but I didn't know how, how that all shook out. But I did know the kitchen sink books that that came out like that would have probably been tundra books and i gotta tell you man when you read a fucking 80s kitchen sink book they all miss the fucking mark a little bit you know what i'm saying like they they just they don't have it like uh, his dennis kitchen's like taste for like the new material it just wasn't there but the kitchen sink books that i did like are these freaking books man yeah, it, it it spun my head around reading this article. And Tom Palmer Jr. does some really good writing. Like for McLeod, a quote I pulled is, reputation as Thomas Edison and Marshall McLuhan of comics. <laughs> That's pretty fun. Oh, understanding comics is not out yet, but it's already making waves. Yeah, he describes understanding comics as a book that will be talked about for years. Spot on. He mentions the From Hell collection. The second volume of From Hell collection is coming out. That was serialized, of course, in Taboo. And then uh, Tundra starts putting out collections that Kitchen Sink then puts out. And the collections, I guess, are where Alan Moore's notes appear, which is like the extensive footnotes that are in most of the From Hells that I have seen. I don't know if those were in Taboo or not, but I remember that being pretty revelatory whenever I got hold of From Hell and you would see like every single page cited where he was getting the information that's in that book. Yeah, really cool. Mind-blowing stuff, man. Hell of an article. This 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 was a really fun one to go through and to think again. This is next to Dark Horse announcing their universe, Vertigo launching, Death Made happening, loaded. Just loaded. And then a great sidebar by Bisley 
And my favorite part about this is uh, <laughs> he describes the death of Superman. This, this last paragraph is about the death of Superman. He says the artwork was crap. It should have been World War III, and then darkness descends on the earth, and rain starts to fall. And he's totally right, man. These guys should have torn down, destroyed cities like like the Miracle Man fight. You know, what would it take to kill Superman? And it would have been an almost extinction-like event. Imagine if a bunch of nuclear bombs go off, you would get that black cloud of ash. This thing should have been Armageddon, and they did shit with it. Yeah, and not to mention that, like, the guy who's keeping so many villains in check is now dead. God damn it, you need to put on your boots and get out there and start raising some hell. Now, the thing that I will say about Bizman is he is such a darling and 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 he he's he's got patrons. And fucking Kevin Eastman is like Kevin Eastman must have added a wing to like the <laughs> left side of his house and fucking Glenn Danzig added a wing to the right side of Biz's <laughs> house because he basically draws comics and shit exclusively for those guys. And, and by house, I think you mean castle. They're building towers on, the, on that castle, man. That's, that is the word, man. <laughs> and, and I do have it on good authority that uh, that Kanye West goes to visit him at that castle sometimes, so he probably has more patrons than, than we even realize. I, I obviously like Bisley. I often sing his praises art-wise, but he talks about how he got into comics and he tells a story that he used to be a lion tamer. It's ridiculous and absurd and totally on point of Bisley as sort of this character uh, <laughs> that's spinning yarn. So anyway, th- this article uh, stood out to me and, and probably the peak of my wizard fandom is summed up in this issue in this article. Shazam. It's the big red cheese. A look back at at the captain who was truly a comic book Marvel. This is a history of of Captain Marvel. Uh, Starts out at Fawcett, ends up at DC, minus the name, at least on the uh, masthead. Yeah. So I like Captain Marvel better than a lot of these characters, especially at this time. It's a kid that transforms into a superhero. I like that concept. It's kind of wholesome. It's attractive art. C.C. Beck is mostly credited with Captain Marvel stuff. Captain Marvel's popularity spins off into other books. So noteworthy is Mac Rayboy, who did Captain Marvel Jr. and had a totally different style. A much more realistic, heavy, dark style compared to C.C. Beck's very cartoony, dots for eyes kind of style. And it all works. It's a very attractive comic, and even the spinoffs are, are, are very good looking. Yeah, there was some fun trivia uh, strewn about here. So, like, his initial first appearance that we all know as being Wiz Comics number one, that technically wasn't the case. There was like an Ashcan preview edition of a comic called Flash Comics, which is where the character uh, would have shown up at at first. And I believe perhaps even in that one, he would have been known by his original name, Captain Thunder. But the same month that that comic was uh, sort of printed the Flash comics from DC comes out, so they had to make call some audibles, as they say, man. But uh, the big writer for uh, Captain Marvel back then, the guy who like really made that series sing, was a um, sci-fi writer named Otto Bender, who is from like that first generation of sci-fi fandom, the pulps and all that stuff, man. I Robot is his famous uh, story. I'm gonna flip through this as we talk. Yeah, yeah, do it. And then uh, a lot of amazing innovations occurred with the original Fawcett series. One of them being the first like big major serial of um, you know the Monster Society of Evil took place over um, four consecutive years worth of storytelling. Now in these old comics, there would be yeah, there's your silhouette. Sil- silhouette. <laughs> Everybody's there. Hold on. There um, would be say four stories in an issue. So like one of those stories would be this serialized. Uh, story, but you know, Fawcett had many uh, superheroes that that were a part of the uh, the uh, pantheon, and the first major crossovers were done, like in Captain Marvel too. This is the other thing, by the way, man. It's like Talking Tiger. That was some shit where I would get these world's finest comics, and there would be a Shazam story publicized, but they would call him Captain Marvel on the inside. And I just didn't understand it at all, man. I knew there was something more going on. Well, the character achieves a lot of success initially, and it and it invites DC's ire. So DC sues them because it's supposed, you know, they allege it's a Superman ripoff. And Fawcett wins several times. But DC has a little deeper pocketbooks. This also coincides with kind of the uh, collapse of the Golden Age. And eventually, they just give up. 
through the appeals process. The article doesn't say exactly how DC comes to own these rights, but I guess it may have been through a settlement of some sort. I, I, I don't know the specifics of that. The writer of this article concludes with, uh, there just may not be a place for a good old fashioned hero in today's comics. Think about that if you want to be depressed. <laughs> Talking about the the struggles that, that Shazam has had and Captain America has had. I mean, it, uh, in it does, this era. Yeah, it, it it doesn't age well. You know what I'm saying, man? Like, I'm I am rereading Miracle Man, and the stuff that Alan Moore has to do, he has a lot of heavy lifting to try to like make that thing fit into a 1980s culture. Hollywood heroes, little known actor gets Superman role. That's Dean Cain and Lois and Clark. Uh, Pretty long-running series, pretty successful. Probably one of DC's early successes on television. You think of all their like WB shows now. In a way, perhaps they trace back to Lois and Clark. It's all we had, man. There is a uh, mention of Joss Whedon punching up or writing the script for Toy Story. I never knew that before. That's a... Uh... Kind of interesting. They mention Toy Story? They do, and it's it's a very small mention. You know, this is like the Alex Ross Marvels where, of course, I won't find it now, did, but did, uh, it's it's just a very, like, a one-line... Did they say the word Pixar? High-tech tunes, an offshoot of Pixar Corporation, will be doing all the animation for Disney's Toy Story. That's so cool, man. Oh, okay, I see Lasseter's name. Yeah, is directing the film from Joss Whedon, Buffy the Vampire Slayer script. Tom Hanks voice Buzz Lightyear. So it's it's this paragraph is the only mention, but pretty interesting. Again, time, you know, I don't put all of this stuff together at the same time until I start going through these and you realize like, okay, early days of Pixar and Toy Story are here. I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated to take a look at IMDb to see when uh, Toy Story eventually comes out. Because it's not 1993, I don't think. No, it's maybe 95, I'm guessing. 94, 95, maybe late 94, maybe around Thanksgiving. Um, under the video, theater, and theme parks section of this column, he talks about Hellraiser 3. And uh, he says, those with faint hearts or deeply religious convictions should avoid Hellraiser 3 because it's very unsettling. <laughs> Even I left the theater thinking some of the scenes had gone too far. <laughs> We we cut our teeth on these flicks, man. So I have nothing to say about that shit, man. But of course, this is this is the big story here, man. The fucking biggest tragedy in fucking nineties films. Like like uh, so many people should be fucking ashamed of themselves for what happened there with with uh, Brandon Lee getting shot on set. It, it, it disgusts me to think about it, man. You know, I would I want to punch a lot of dudes in the jaw who could have prevented something like that from happening. Yeah, it, it's horrific. And it's hard to separate it from, you know, like when you think Crow, it's it's hard to not think this big successful comics film, but it's it's horrific. And they go through in detail several incidents that happened on this set, whether it's negligence, bad luck, uh, you know, combination of, of a few things. But apparently there were a lot of problems on the set. Such a shame. Palmer's Picks. Try sinking your teeth into concrete. This is Paul Chadwick's Dark Horse book concrete it's kind of a when i started reading comics this was a pillar of dark horse and of creator owned and black and white and alternative i think he appears in the very first dark horse presents number one he so does yeah he's there from the beginning of dark horse comics and it's a very celebrated series he was the darling of the of the awards man harvey's uh eisner's all that good stuff I appreciated this article because I don't, I didn't know much about Paul Chadwick. I knew a few things, man. And some of the things I knew uh, are actually not in this article. For instance, he was a part of early fandom comics and there was a very famous, like, uh, I think it's called Appa 5 that Frank Miller did strips in, but Paul Chadwick did strips in the, the very same issues of that. So, so he was around for a long time and I didn't know that he worked in the movie industry as like storyboard artists and stuff. I didn't either, and Pee-wee's Big Adventure is one of the movies he storyboards. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. And uh, the way that they... Uh, Tom, I love you, man. Tom Palmer. But um, they talks about, like, then breaking into comics. Like, like it's it's not a lateral move or a low... Like, so, actually, that's pretty cool of, of Tom, because he's like, yeah, comics rule. Well, even working on a night... You know, like, some, some movie that we consider good is, is far removed from being able to do your own thing. No, that's true. You know, I can see that if you if you're ambitious and have these ideas. So, concrete is uh, it's a human who gets captured by aliens or something. His brain gets put into this body, 
Yeah, big concrete, you know, five ton body or something. Right. So it, it kind of alienates him from human contact, physical contact, obviously makes him very different physically. And then this is, you know, average guy trying to manage what happens in this situation. And so, of course, there's lots of spotlight on him and he does stunts with this, like swimming across the ocean uh, with sponsorship. Um, you know, this looks like some of his origin stuff. He climbs Mount Everest in one story. Paul Chadwick was also interested in environmental stuff. So yeah. Concrete was interested in environmental stuff and would draw attention to that. Did an Earth Day special uh, with that in mind. And, you know, very attractive art. This is 1987, and comics did not have the wide range of especially indie artists working at this level of, of uh, polish. Yeah, um, I would use Palmer's picks for, for recommendations. And once again, keeping with the theme of like my comics and adult comics, there was something about this that I felt was uh, adult-oriented. Not in, not in any sort of gratuitous thing, but it just seemed... Uh, I seen way more adults reading this kind of thing than, than otherwise. And what I like about this particular article is how Palmer's kind of describing the series and how it works macro and micro where there would be these mini series that were part of uh, the concrete canon and they would obviously tackle bigger sorts of narratives man but when concrete shows up in a dark horse presents or something then those smaller stories are just about uh, how the character kind of traverses everyday situations with 5,000 pound body I yeah. like that he will go on to be one of the legend guys, mm -hmm. which is Dark Horse's, I don't know, upper echelon creator-owned imprint. And this is a you know one of those miniseries that you're talking about. This is a probably as he slows down in production. You know that first uh, series I think was published by monthly for like ten issues, which is pretty remarkable for indie comics creation and output at that level. Especially, yeah, so I was going to say that level of craft is really really sharp. I I, I actually quite like that black and white far more than I like this. That happens a lot, you know, where um, the He's cartoonist a... will earn more time or, or maybe be considered better, you know, at their craft, but it's not as, it doesn't do as much for me as a reader. Well, oh, the, the color stuff? or what? Well, just the more sophisticated, whenever I think they're better by most measures, it's less interesting. Uh, yeah. I like the rougher edges. I like that younger energy. Agreed. He does these as backups, the hundred, uh, hundred horrors, and I don't... I don't know if Tom Palmer mentions those. He, they might have started after this Palmer's Picks, but they would be these little backups, and they would be like something... The one I always remember is the character waking up and being paralyzed. This is it. <laughs> they were... The concept is just horrors, right? Something... A nightmarish type scenario. And so this one always stuck with me. This character wakes up in the morning and can't move. Mm -hmm. And it just goes through like this whole... I guess, end of his his life, you know, just being stuck there, paralyzed. So that was like a little fun backup, unrelated to Concrete, except that it appeared in Concretes. Just getting a little sadism out of his system. Yeah, lots of lots of nightmare Gil scenarios. Gilbert Hernandez had Birdland to exercise some demons <laughs> in me, and Chadwick has his Hundred Horrors or whatever it's called. So he did a lot of these. Um, you know, this is a like a six-issue miniseries. Nice trade dress. Yeah, good 15, 20 year run. Well designed. You would always hear about Concrete Movie. You know, that's been reported for maybe the history of Concrete. Yeah, I guess that's right, yeah. And it, it makes sense knowing now that he had connections to Hollywood. He probably had his own connections. Mike Richardson and Dark Horse have a much higher track record of turning these comic books into movies. Probably a good thing that they didn't, man. But it could have been, it could have been all him too, by the way. Like, you know, he saw a fucking uh, Time Cop. He saw barbed wire, you know what I mean? <laughs> and it could have been a stalemate issue, like where it's like, you know, his his 50% equity or however that shook out, man. Maybe he's like, you know what? Maybe I don't want Uwe Bull to direct uh, the, the, the concrete movie. At the time of this issue, Comics Greatest World coming out, Paul Chadwick draws King Tiger, one of the stories, one of the comic books. Like I said earlier, man, doing favors, man. He's laying down. Laying down, letting himself get get pinned, just so that he could keep doing his uh, concrete comics. Yeah. So th this is his artwork for Comics Greatest World. Probably a paycheck. Even less inspired, exactly. That's what I'm saying. What a difference coloring makes. You know, you talk about liking his work in black and white, and I agree it looked really good. I think his color concrete stuff, far superior to this. And 
maybe it's the drawing, but I, I imagine it's a lot of coloring. This is Joyless Comics. This Comics Greatest World stuff is fully Joyless. It's everybody taking a check, man. I saw uh, I saw the Kessel name mm -hmm. in there, and the Kessels will then go on, like, eventually do cross-gen, and cross-gen's the most jobberish fucking thing in, in the history of con in, the, in the past 20 years, man, of like, okay, not only will I, like, yeah, here's, here's your um, work for higher paycheck, but now you have to come live in my compound. Fuck that, man. Tom Palmer does mention 100 Horrors. Okay. So it, 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 sh it must have started right around this time. Fun backups does speak of a dark, a dark uh, subconscious there. <laughs> and then books that he plugs, Ho Chi Anderson's King, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. biography. I actually passed this up in a dollar box last week. <laughs> it took a long time for it to fully come to fruition, man. It, it recently got collected uh, within, well, 10 years ago, man, but... Ho Chi Anderson, really interesting cartoonist. He's somebody whose work I do enjoy looking at when I come across it. Fanographics is putting out the collection of Like a Velvet Glove cast in iron uh, from Dan Clow's 8-Ball. He recommends buying the 8-Ball issues because of all the other stuff that's in them. I agree, but uh, that first Velvet Glove, I love the cover of it. It's yeah. a really cool cover. Yeah, yeah, we show it off in an earlier episode. And next month, Love and Rockets, so fun Palmer's picks. Comic Watch, X-Factor number six, uh, first appearance of Apocalypse, and New Mutants number 29, first appearance of Strongman, or Strong Guy, what's his name? Uh, <laughs> Strong, Strong Guy. guy. Strong Guy, or as I uh, called him as a boy, Guido, <laughs> though his name is Guido. Guido. <laughs> uh, at this time, he's an X-Factor, but the first appearance, I brought this because it's Bill Sienkiewicz drawing this in 1985. I think this is just revolutionary. I can't imagine reading this off the stands in 1985. People, the, the, the thing is, man, like, Strong Guy's proportions are so wild and insane, and People basically abided by the Bill Sienkiewicz proportions. Like, here's our guy right there, man. And when you see Larry Stroman draw him, he's keeping that same kind of like hunched back, all that sort of thing, man. Same kind of goes for the Warlock character. Those are like the two big staples that Sienkiewicz had uh, in the in these early days, man, on, on, on New Mutants. And people, by and large, kind of like abided by the craziness of, of his designs on those two characters. Yeah, Sienkiewicz is such a, uh, like I said, I think he's one of the, the most influential of the 80s guys, and that looks like that's a, just one page of Strong Guy in there, but... A cameo appearance, man. Whenever, uh, I, I spent time with Chris Claremont, and we were talking about, like, you know, his favorite artists that he worked with, blah, 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 and he said what he liked about working with uh, Sienkiewicz is that Bill Sienkiewicz can draw subtext. Like, he was able to be far more florid in his script notes to just, like... It became an exercise of give Bill a lot of stuff to think about and just accept whatever comes down the pike. That makes sense why, you know, he collaborates with Alan Moore a lot. And mm. if you look at Alan Moore's scripts, it feels like that's how he works. And it makes sense that Sienkiewicz is good at that, that Alan Moore would find him and want to work with him because it seems like that's sort of how he writes. Yeah. Sam Keith buying a little bit of ad placement for... A, uh, an issue number five, man, which the only other person to do this sort of thing would be uh, McFarlane buying ads for later uh, books in the series. Picks from the Wizard's Hat, Deathmate Prologue, Windsor Smith. It says Rob Liefeld there. Um, Jim Lee is actually the, the guy who inks this. We mentioned earlier this issue. He talks about the pressure of inking over Windsor Smith. Jim Lee has acknowledged Barry Windsor Smith as, a, as an artist he admired, so I'm sure that carries a little bit of extra pressure, a little extra weight with Sin it. Sienkiewicz recently, um, did, well, no, not, he did an interview uh, at San Diego Comic-Con, and they were asking him about his inking career, and he said that you know he would have liked to have inked Jack Kirby if it was possible, and they asked him what, what kind of pressure would that be for you to, to, to ink somebody like that, and uh, Sienkiewicz just says, like, at a certain point, you like, you got to, like, Exhale and do your fucking job, man. A real preview here of Deathmate, what to expect. <laughs> <laughs> Sabretooth number one. Mark Tex, man. Look this at is... that shit right there. You know what I like about Mark Tex's paintings, man? You definitely can see it here. Uh, it goes against every rule of of, <laughs> of, of, of of painting to use black in, in shadow. And he's like the only guy I know who... Now, this isn't the perfect example, but... 
he uses black in his painting and almost nobody that you see who, who paints will, will do that. They, they talk about the gimmick of the die cut cover. Look at how meaningless just horrible <laughs> i don't know what you know if that adds a dollar to the cost of this book or a dollar 50 but oh it's what a waste of money yeah totally this is the most ink for him i think like it's just almost black this is the jay lee school of like how do you put down a bunch of pages i i dug this stuff though this is probably fresh off of his wolverine run K Fabers, uh, we have a show and tell episode live on the channel for uh, for what we call Outlaw Comics, and uh, take a look at that episode and make a call in the comments, man. Do you think this fits the bill for being an Outlaw comic? Uh, kind of like divorce yourself from the color component, and just look at that artwork. And I got to tell you, man, it doesn't feel far away from Faust to me. I put him in that camp. Like you look at his art style, it's not it's not controlled, it's not tight like like a lot of the extreme and wild storm kind of artists. And that's part of what I think of as those outlaw comics. Cyberforce Zero, Walt Simonson cash in the image check. This was such a big deal. Like Silvestri will do interviews at, at this time period all over over the place. Just uh, talking about like I got Walt Simonson. I got like I don't I, Simonson may have been off of doing like any like substantial work uh, at at this point right here, but uh, you know Sylvester has a couple dollars in the coffers, man, and and he seduces Simonson. That's the thing. These guys they were comics fans, man, and they were basically all getting their heroes to work on stuff. You know, uh, Liefeld is getting Keith Giffen. Uh, Jim Valentino brought Alan Moore to Image. He loves to, like mentioning that. Yeah, Simonson, obviously legendary for his run on Thor. Probably his most recent work would have been a big run on Fantastic Four that I think is really sharp. And in our wizard coverage, the thing that we would mention, it would be uh, Terminator Robocop was with Frank Miller writing. It's very strange to see him doing these types of characters because this is sort of a second generation of superheroes. You know, you think of Thor as being that Silver Age kind of character. These are could not be more different. You know, they're all metal and cyborgs and muscles. And and by the way, he's using storytelling. Like, he, <laughs> he's he's not just drawing pinups and shit like that. Like, he's doing his damnedest to, like, tell a freaking story. Very interesting to see his style applied to the image put into the image universe because he, you know, he has these effects that he's done for a long time. Like how do you draw metal, you know, and, and some of his line work is very different than, than if you think of John Byrne as a contemporary who was very successful, Simonson's line work is very, very different and, you know, has been his whole career. And in a way it, it fits pretty nice here. The the computer coloring is, is what kind of breaks the, the illusion though, man, it's too, it's too pristine for his kind of, cause he has a raw art style, man, that, that, it has like an organic nature to it and it's divorced from the computer coloring as far as my tastes go. He, uh, Eric Larson was another big Walt Simonson fan and would talk about him a lot in like the Savage Dragon letter column. Yeah. And then he did the all splash page issue and would talk about Walt Simonson's Thor issue that That's was right. an all splash page issue. Secret Weapons number one, uh, I guess I'm proud to say I don't have in my boxes. I do, but <laughs> we don't have to bring that thing out. Deadpool number one, uh, Notable for Joe Madureira's very early Joe Madureira. I believe he's 19 or so at this point. So very young, getting a high profile book and a book that is even higher in profile now looking back. De Deadpool had his, his shots. Like Rob Liefeld created a, some, you know, glancing, uh, measuring jabs with this Deadpool character that got us kind of excited. But when we saw this Joe Mad stuff, this kind of like created the, the excitement uh, around, around the character. Now, these comics are unreadable. Um, Fabian doesn't do any favors here, but uh, man, it's it's fun stuff to look at because Joe Mad, uh, he's he's not shy about this. And in fact, it becomes a hindrance in his comics career moving forward, but he's a big video game mark. And he, he must have been a rich boy, man, because he had access to Neo Geo, and that was a, like a six or seven hundred dollar system. <laughs> uh, the the Fatal Fury games were his speed, man, and and he would use that aesthetic. He like brought the aesthetic from those Japanese uh, graphics into uh, the work here, and also he was an early mark for for uh, anime and, and and manga. Yeah, I don't see the anime and manga as much here as you see as he gets, I guess, more successful. But these are really well drawn for a guy who. I don't know how much he did before this. I think a little Marvel Comics presents, but not much. He, like this is a new cartoonist at this stage, and 
It's pretty strong. I mean, he might not have even been 20 years old here. This is such a wild time for comics. Going through these lists, it's just full of stuff. This is, you know, Matt Wagner. I don't know that we've looked at any of his visuals. Known for Mage and Grendel. Finally gets to do the crossover with Batman that had been in the works for a while and hung up for various legal reasons. I This is one of my favorite Matt Wagner stories, probably because it's of that time period when I had access to it. But he was always known for design, would do lots of different innovative page layouts, uh, readable, one of the early writer artists, maybe not early, but one of the, one of the contemporary writer artists before that became a bad word <laughs> in the 90s. Pretty neat to see this, and uh, there are ash cans and mini comics and a lot of promotion for these books, and I think they're very good looking. I always love the covers. I mean, it was successful enough that there's another Batman uh, <laughs> Grendel story that comes after that two-issue gimmick. Still the Gen X. Yeah, man. And, and like, the tandem of J. Scott Campbell and Alex Gardner, that, that is my teenage years, man. I really love that stuff, and just... just Keep your eyes peeled for how many freaking Gen X ads there are page after page for about the next five turns. It's funny, you know, the Gen X becomes Gen 13 and the Jeffrey Scott becomes J. Scott Campbell. Yeah, man. <laughs> Still working out the kinks. This month's number ones, I brought a bunch of these because there are so many. Everything's happening. Like, Ultraverse is starting. This is Prime. Norm Brayfogle draws this. I think this is the best looking of the Ultraverse books. I don't know that we even have to flip through it, to be honest. You can see it all in the cover, but kid turned superhero bodybuilder. Good with veins. I brought Savage Dragon number one because damn you, wizard, if you refuse to uh, cover this. <laughs> this was my book. You know, there was no book I was more excited about than this book when it came out. And one of the things Larson did in the miniseries, every issue would be splash page, double splash page with some villains. So he deviates from that a little bit. But between the miniseries and this one, Dragon went through some dark times. His girlfriend was killed in his apartment when somebody came looking for him. I gotta show you a panel that really fucked me up. That that I just I couldn't understand at all. I didn't know what I was looking at. Yeah. This thing. I was like, is this a fucking like arm guy? Like, is this like <laughs> like this drawing? It's wrong. There's something wrong about it. But like in my very young, you know, we established I'm 11 years old. Like, I stared at this drawing for so long because I didn't understand. I, it just, it looked like a worm, man. Yeah. <laughs> Very confusing. Yeah, he, he would always joke in interviews about this, you know. The people would ask him if the dragon breathed fire or whatever. So, dragon's drinking pretty heavy. Weird that he has a flask while sitting at the bar, but sure. <laughs> hey, man, that's and, just a little uh, hair of the dog. <laughs> gives him a, an excuse to breathe fire. He goes after this character with chainsaws. Man, this was this was it. This Absolutely. was perfect for me. So. Absolutely. Like, for whatever reason, sick little fuckhead middle schoolers love stuff with blood. And that is the only image comic that, like, would give us blood every issue uh, religiously. We it was R-rated. That was, that was kind of shocking because it was, like, cussing, blood, sex, naked. It was all in there. And as you say, it was the only book that was doing that. You know, it was, like, adult superheroes except... It wasn't very adult in any way except our rated content. Um, Union number one. I brought this only because it's Mark Texera. We yeah. just looked at Sabretooth. This is also listed in picks. Guy at the top of his game. And you get to see his version of these image image style characters. Stormwatch, Union, still slinging a lot of ink. Very rough. Very, uh, you know, gestural and chaotic and texture compared again to the very squeaky clean Wild Storm style. Yeah, I love it. Uh, if you go back, like, this is almost like a precursor to, like, Stephen Platt. Like, whenever mm -hmm. Stephen Platt would draw his um, civilians. Platt's a pretty good guy to compare. I think there are some parallels in page layouts and, fate, you know, and, and how they're constructing some of the figures. So, pretty good month for him. I bet his paycheck was nice that month. Get it while it's hot, man. One of the indie books of the time period. It makes the list. Blood Fire, Lightning Comics. This character is AIDS. Right? I don't know. I haven't read this. I, I, I think I think so. And like the, I, the blood, that's like super bad taste. It, like I think I think I'm right. He might contract it in like issue seven or something like that. I obviously read this nonsense too. These would um, be available in uh, triple packs at uh, the Dollar Tree when I was a little dude. I picked this up a long time ago. 
hadn't seen it again until I just pulled it out for this issue and am kind of delighted by it. Mm-hmm. It has that amateur quality of like the black and white explosion books that I like. Yeah. Also violent. The color, I think, is kind of fun. Markers, I'm guessing, the way these edges are around like some of the color holds says marker to me. Mm-hmm. So I enjoyed flipping through this a lot more than I expected to. You know, ninja-like dudes in tights battling G.I. Joe type Green Berets. Of course. Yeah, yeah. I just wish that he would have uh, lettered it. Even if the lettering sucked, it would be better than um, th- these fonts and stuff. Early digital lettering here. Yeah, with a straight up built into the Mac font. <laughs> Man, everybody's doing everything. <laughs> Neil Adams doing Mr. T and the T Force. I think we have to show at least, a, I think probably like close to the last page where um, we have the revelation of like the crack babies. Because that's the shit that, uh, you know, like I grew up in. Uh, there it is. That's the situation that we grew up in, man. And we knew some people who uh, we could easily have accused of being crack babies. And just to see the word crack baby on paper, we're like, ah, that's you. <laughs> Fuck you. And keeping his, his fullest <laughs> part of it. It's a crack baby, fool. Not right. What do you think this is? It's a crack baby. Man. This reminds me a lot of Rampage Jackson, who would play him... Uh, B.A. in the A-Team movie. Oh, yeah, He's the MMA fighter. Shit. Yeah, it looks more like him than it does uh, Mr. T, I think. <sighs> One more, because I can't stop myself. Faction. Another uh, example of 1993, man. Everything's happening. Kind of shows you the spectrum. Again, digital lettering. The same font. Yeah, so... Everybody's trying to make comics and trying to figure out how. This this stood out to me as being like somebody messed up somewhere. A couple more blank pages. I don't know if that would have been pages that stuck together That's when a it was whole printed. Signature, man. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, gradient is one of those early staples of digital comics. That was like one of the early color effects you could pull off. And people would always do it with colors that really don't blend together. Yeah. So if you do it with... with uh, opposite colors it becomes gray in the middle right um this isn't too bad because you get purple you know pink and blue but sometimes people would do like yellow and purple and then you'd have like mud in the middle of it <laughs> more blank this pages is ridiculous really strange but small indie you know almost probably self-published equivalent of self-publishing in 1993 gen gen x is continuing their advertising campaign may 1993 top 100 jim rug I ask you, how many Marvel and DC books are in the top 10? Same as Valiant, one apiece. (laughs) Image is killing it with seven in the top 10. You wonder how many of those shipped this month? You know, well, let's move on. (laughs) Past the, uh, this is a lot of Batman books make the collector top 10, speculator stuff. Uh, I think four of the books are Batman related, anticipating some upcoming action in Batman. But we get to the, the Wizard Market Watch, and the reason I say, like, let's jump ahead to this, they talk about the back issues are, are slow, like nothing's really moving in the back issues, and they actually prognosticate that because there are so many books coming out this summer and dollars are spread so thin that there will be opportunities for some books to get hot. To me, that's that's really the the... Now we see the damage of all of the image late books yeah. and all of the money that's tied up in these books that aren't shipping and that stores then, even if they're not paying in advance, they aren't getting books instead of those books. You know, there's only so many books on their shelves. They're not generating the money. But also if some good book is coming out, they may not even have the funds to take a chance on it or to try some of these titles. To me, this is the you see all the confusion in the marketplace. You see the problems that late books have caused or are now in the middle of causing. We started this knowing about the 90s bubble and, and the, the bursting of that bubble. Lots of blame to be passed around from speculators to collectors buying gimmick covers, encouraging more gimmick covers, all of this stuff. But ultimately, those books that ship late or don't ship at all, that's real hardline dollars. You know, like that's hard to overcome. And it feels like we're getting summer of 93 maybe where that reaches a point of no return, a breaking point. Very, it's very scary, and and it just goes to show, just like that, just how weird this business is, man. Because you know, if you order some macaroni for your store, like you get fucking macaroni. You know what I'm saying, man? It's it's just it's so odd. And then the fact that like the back issue part of it has to be kind of a part of the business, man. It's the one-two punch because 
the back issues aren't selling. Right. You know, like these stores are in in bad shape and you're reading Wizard going, there's 37 more, you know, superhero universes now. Business is booming, but like on the retail end, business isn't booming. So th- this was where I start to see these these the future that we know is coming starts to appear big time in this issue for me. Yeah, it starts to co- become really clear. And, and we've, we've always heard uh, sort of about this and we're seeing it develop. It's coming into focus. Not a lot of action on any of these pages. Connorsville has another uh, <laughs> another trading card show or, or comic book show. My dude, the very first uh, Pittsburgh comic convention at at the at the Monroeville Expo Mart, where the fucking Pittsburgh Comic Con was for twenty years. You know for good 15 year run man three dollar admission back then todd mcfarlane was the guy if this if this is if this is pittsburgh comic-con number one it has a weird name there but you know how sometimes the first thing has a different weird yeah. name uh if that's the one man uh todd mcfarlane was was the guest there at that one and it would be stanley uh year year two this is strange. This is like a Rob Liefeld strip that's buried in here. I, I think he bought four or five pages of ad space and fucking put in the comic, man. Sword and Stone. That doesn't go anywhere. The, the classic uh, Rob Liefeld comic. Right, yeah. It doesn't go anywhere, but uh, listen. Another example of DC Comics ruining a Batman ad. <laughs> There's just nothing Bat-like about that, really. Incredible. And, and the bleed's terrible. It looks like a cover of Faust. Yeah, it kind of does. And Wizard Profile. So this is the first of these, man. This is going to be throughout the rest of our episodes, probably. Talked a little bit about Mike Allred last issue in the uh, Palmer's Picks. One just brief note here. Favorite comic of all time, Fantastic Four 48. It's where the Silver Surfer shows up. I think this is really cool because recently Mike Allred did a big run on Silver Surfer. So it's pretty cool that, you know, one of the comics, one of the characters that he just always loved, he's gotten to gotten a chance to actually work on and, and do some memorable comics with. And that brings us to the end of Wizard Magazine, number 23. I had a good time with this one. Yeah, listen, man, we're just barely getting into into my era, man. When the Kayfabers join us next time, man, we're going to be on this uh, Wizard number 24. The Nightfall storyline is officially underway, man. Batman's back shattered beyond repair. Or is it? We've been hearing about it. We've been spe- seeing speculation about it. So it's finally going to come to fruition with this issue. That'll mark two years in. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that one. Kayfabers, you know what to do. If you haven't already, man, like, subscribe, and follow the Cartoonist Kayfabe YouTube channel. Hit the little bell button once you hit the subscribe button, and it'll let you it'll let you know whenever we have new videos available. We put up one or two a week at the very least. You can pick up Cartoonist Kayfabe merch in our spread shop. There's a link below this video for that. And you guys know what your marching orders are? Read more comics.